Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie still, I suppose. Uh, I am Michael, and I am here with Dr. Leslie R. Miller. Uh, She's a medical doctor and is board certified as a pediatrician, a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and a general psychiatrist. And before we get started, um, be warned that some of the content may not be appropriate for children and may be triggering to some victims of abuse. And so, uh, Dr. Miller, you want to add to your credentials there? (laughs) Um, Just one correction. Um, Mm -hmm. I haven't passed my boards yet. Most people don't understand what a board certification is. Um, It's really just a piece of paper that you have to pass a very expensive and long standardized test for, which I've passed many of those boards. but board certification doesn't occur typically until after you've gotten out of postgraduate training, residency, and fellowship. Okay. And you're the chief resident at Tulane. I am. Currently, yes. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, well, uh, we have kind of a downer of a topic here, but certainly one that doesn't get enough attention, I think. So um, let's start off with, can you tell us a little bit about your history Uh, and experience with victims of trafficking here in the U.S.? Oh, wow. That's a big question. Um, I So I've taken care of a lot of children who have been victims of sex trafficking here in New Orleans, Um, unfortunately. And kind of understandable that we're a port city. Um, It's disturbingly common. And very, very difficult, not only to think about or talk about, um, but also when you have a child who's been through this, to interact with them in a way that is going to be healing and helpful. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think my first case was a Latino girl uh, was probably in my second year of residency, my our my residency and fellowship is a five-year program. Um, and uh, the child was Latina, Hispanic, and she was an American citizen. Her father, however, was undocumented and was being deported. So, unfortunately, legal circumstances... Um, the child, the child ended up being deported with the father. So even now, I don't know that that kid is safe, and that's it's really, really difficult. Um, and honestly, that's the biggest struggle of my job, is that I can't save everyone. And sometimes the legalities and the politics get in the way of really saving children, literally. Well, to try and ease you, hopefully, a little bit on that, um, no, you can't save everyone, but saving one person is enough, and I've heard it said. Um, that you did bring up an important point there, though, I think, uh, that she was a U.S. citizen, because I think that most people in the U.S. think that, that um, victims of sex trafficking are overwhelmingly uh, um, foreign nationals of one stripe or another, whereas the, you know, the statistics are that it's close to half and half, about 40% of sex trafficking victims in the U.S. are U.S. citizens, um, and about a, quarter of the, uh, about a quarter of them are children. And I'm surprised it's only a quarter, honestly, but that's experience bias. Yeah, well, and it could be a lot more anyway. The uh, obviously that it's an underground industry, so the data isn't completely reliable. Right, and so. how do you even get those numbers is a big question. So um, let let's start here with maybe just kind of defining what trafficking is. Uh, again, this is another one of those misconceptions. I think that most people believe that trafficking is really about moving people from place to place which I don't know that that's, I mean, that's certainly a feature in a lot of cases, but it's not really a defining feature, is it? Mm, uh, So there's a lot of different definitions. There's not one generally accepted definition, 
which also makes this difficult from a legal perspective. Um, I did a lot of reading on what is the definition of trafficking based on a case of a young black girl that was being trafficked um, between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Um, and talking to a lot of experts, me, my definition of trafficking is being transported at least across city lines, or really, you don't even have to cross city lines mm -hmm. from your home, your school, where you're supposed to be, and then being housed against your will to do some service that is coerced. Mm -hmm. um, well, that seems to be the defining feature, at least legally here in the U.S. You know, the Justice Department essentially defines sex trafficking as people that are being... Um, threatened, forced, or coerced mm -hmm. uh, into, um, you know, performing commercial sex acts. Mm -hmm. And then anybody in commercial sex acts, even if they weren't coerced, technically speaking, if they're under 18, it, it still qualifies in the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, brings in, I mean, the question there is, like, are you old, old enough at that age to uh, consent to that kind of activity anyway? And the, at least the legal assumption is absolutely not. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Um, so maybe we can get into some specifics here to help people understand. Well, first off, um, so we can kind of get something going here right up front. And we'll reiterate closer to the end. What can our listeners do? to help prevent, um, or prevent would be the ameliorate. right word. Ameliorate. Yeah. Um, Not prevent, necessarily. But. This, uh, this activity, uh, human trafficking in the U.S. generally. This atrocity? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that is the most important question of anything that we're going to talk about. And just to reinforce that, I'll... I'll talk about it now, and then I want us to go back over it at the end, because these are really, at the end of the day, the take-home points that I have for everyone who's listening to this. I've got one, two, three, four, five pieces of advice. All right. Number one, um, advocating through talking to politicians, so truly being an advocate and going to the Capitol and having face-to-face -face conversations Hire a person, if you have the ability, to go advocate for you, um, to increase funding for the departments in the government who fund protecting children. Federally is Department of Child and Family Services, uh, which DCFS, you're going to hear me saying that, and that's what mm -hmm. I'm talking about. A lot of people might know them as Child Protective Services. They're the same entity. Um, severely un underfunded. And the people who are doing this work are literally sacrificing their own mental health to save kids. Um, it, it blows my mind. Like, how wonderful these people are. And unfortunately, they get very burnt out. And you don't want someone who legally, their job is to protect children to be burnt out. They need more funding, bottom line. Uh, number two, learn about the risk factors so that you're able to recognize when someone might be being victimized. And of course, we're going to talk more about that. Uh, number three is to, and I say this so many times to myself and to other people, try to be more comfortable with being uncomfortable. So when we're talking about having conversations with others about race, about sex trafficking, about how our population says they care about children, but they don't show it in actions. Um, embrace that discomfort because nobody ever made any progress 
without getting a little uncomfortable. Uh, number four, if you are in a place in life where you can adopt a child, please do it through foster care instead of a private organization like Catholic Charities. I love Catholic Charities. I, you know, I think they're a great organization, but the kids who really need saving are not going to come through Catholic Charities. They're going to come through the, fo the foster care system. And last but not least, encourage and educate others about the things that you learned today um, and try to consider becoming a foster parent or learn more about it. There's another way you can get more involved in that you can volunteer and become a court-appointed special advocate, which I will hear for, refer, or wait, which I will now refer to as CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocate, which you go through a training program and then the volunteer hours are on average one to two hours a week. So most people who are working, have families, other stuff, can fit it into their lives. But the role that you take is as a... I want to say civilian, or if you're a Harry Potter fan, a muggle to me, um, you volunteer to speak on the behalf in courts, in medical interactions, to influence the de decisions that are made for a, one child that represent your understanding of what's in the child's best interest. So you're only function is to help communicate what's best for the child and like if you had an adult brain and you put it into a child's brain you're supposed to facilitate that communication of what the child wants and needs okay well uh, let's get into specifics a little bit um i, I know that the the common misconception is that uh that people get captured or abducted into this life literally <clears throat> being snatched up off the street or what have you, but that's not really, that's not the reality of, of how most of these people end up, um, captives, correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, and so what, what are the more common pathways that, uh, I guess that children go down to find, hmm, now I'm making it sound like it's intentional. Oh, no, no, I, I, I like that line of questioning. Um, to find themselves uh, captured into this horrible industry. Yeah, so not captured, um, but, mm, right. I think most listeners will understand what you're asking. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that put people at risk, and we can look at the statistics that we have to kind of identify groups of people, groups of children, who have a higher chance of somehow getting into a trafficking situation. Um, and I think knowing those risk factors is really important in understanding all of this, especially for those out there that have no experience with what we're talking about. So learning the risk factors makes you muggles more likely to actually recognize it if it happens to show up in your life. And I mean, often I think it's related, it, somehow substance abuse is related um, in every story that I hear. Um, you know, most people know about sex trafficking from, like, hearing political discussions or watching movies. Um, but a lot of the coercion that I've seen and experienced in taking care of these people, substances are usually involved. Um, uh, more often I, opiates. Yeah. Um, can I ask you there, is this... Uh, substance abuse that was introduced as part of the uh, part of them 
being brought into this industry or is this substance abuse that is being taken advantage of to keep them there? Well, like, is it, is it a pre-existing substance abuse issue that is being uh, leveraged, I guess? No. And the, I mean, you could, you can deduce why methamphetamines and opiates would be the drug of choice that is used by people who are the perpetrators of trafficking because, because like they're you, both highly addictive. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, it's used in a, a manner of control and it is not normally pre-existing or in my, in my experience, like mm-hmm. I don't know what's actually happening on the ground in reality. Cause like mm-hmm. even our stats are not necessarily the most reliable just mm-hmm. based on, their inability to collect the data. Um, you know, all of these, a lot of victims are not even recognized. Yeah. So, And it's essentially aggregated from notes that were uh, information that the victims volunteered. So if they mm-hmm. leave something out, then it's not included in the data. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but it's, it's, uh, it's frequently some form of control through threat or coercion. Mm-hmm. Um, in this way, and I did see some statistics that in uh, a lot of youth cases, like a surprising number to me, um, there was like a romantic involvement with the trafficker that um, was was the method of control used. And that's based on self-report? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, what is the name of that syndrome where you fall in love with your captor? Stockholm. Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. I wouldn't, number one, self-report data is, Mm -hmm. should be taken with a grain of salt, especially in this case, because there is so much coercion and, you know, everybody, manipulation, Mm -hmm. power, control. So a person can essentially be brainwashed to believe something. Like I'm sure these traffickers told their victims that they love them. Um, you know, it can be the same thing with physical abuse. Like you tell people lies and you control this and isolate the victim so that the victim actually believes your lies. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence of that, you know, a lot of what I do as a child psychiatrist is helping on a developmentally appropriate level without saying things that will re-traumatize victims is helping them to unlearn the lies that they've been trained to believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there's also use of um, other relationships of the victims to control them, right? Uh, threats to <laughs> children, parents, whatever else. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, usually it's threats, like homicidal threats that I've come across mm-hmm. and that the perpetrator makes the victim believe that you would, your f- first thought might be that they're going to kill them, but it's actually threatening to kill people of value to the victim, like parents, siblings, uh, sometimes future romantic partners. Mm -hmm. Um, They try to convince the victim that they cannot live or someone's going to get severely hurt or lose their life if the victim doesn't comply. Yeah, I I think if if we back out a little here, the threats to loved ones generally are more effective coercion than threats to the the Mm -hmm. person themselves Mm -hmm. in you know, across the board, not just in trafficking situations. Oh yeah. Um, how, uh, so the, the, the children that you've treated that had been, um, victims of trafficking, they escaped in some way or another. Is there hmm. like, how do they escape from, um, this life? In the cases that I've experienced, it's actually all the same of like how they came to interact with me and that they've threatened to commit suicide 
and they end up in a psychiatric unit or an emergency room. And, you know, a victim can tell literally anybody that that person calls 911. They go to the emergency room. They get admitted to a psychiatric unit, hopefully, depending on where you live. Unfortunately, child psychiatrists are extremely rare in this country. And even more rare are inpatient child psychiatry units in hospitals or psychiatric hospitals that children can be admitted to, which is another area of advocacy, is advocating for more funding to train doctors in general. Because interestingly, the training programs that are required for me to do my job are funded by Medicare. Mm -hmm. Extremely underfunded, and it's a huge problem to why physicians are not the ones taking care of these people. And often it ends up being nurse practitioners. No hit on nurse practitioners. I, I know wonderful ones. But there is a reality in the difference in the number of years and the type of training. Uh, a side question there. Um, in this world of managed health care that we oh God. live in now, uh, I, I know that my experience with... Um, with regular hospitals is that the goal is to stabilize the patient and free up the bed. Um, and as soon as the patient is stable enough to be let go, they are let go. Do, do, uh, inpatient psychiatric units function more or less the same way? Is it? Uh, kind of. Um, I think in psychiatry, like we're very, very focused on safety. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, people who've been jaded by this, I'm not going to uh, say cuss words today, uh, system, <laughs> this medical system that we have that is dominated by people who work for the insurance companies who, at the end of the day, are attempting to make medical decisions that they don't have the training to make. Mm -hmm. Um, you got a bunch of administrators making choices instead right. of doctors. So like psychiatrists who, I mean, this goes for adults and children. Like we fight like hard every single day against insurance companies. And a lot mm -hmm. of other, you know, medical doctors do the same thing and nurses and everyone else who helps us do what we're able to do because of the teamwork and advocacy and fight that we have inside of us. Mm -hmm. So MCOs, oh Lord, <laughs> um, you know, there's too many hands in the pot to making a decision on what is the decision that's going to keep someone safe in a psychiatric situation. Um, there are some poorly managed psychiatric hospitals that absolutely will not keep anyone more than 14 days because that's when the insurance company stops paying. And the hospitals are actually the ones who fit, who foot the bill. Um, but going into the cost of healthcare is going to be, it can be a whole nother episode. <laughs> um, but yeah, too many hands in the pot, okay. too many cooks in the kitchen. Um, back to these victims, like, like how, uh, how have their experiences affected them psychologically? We're speaking more into your expertise. I oh think, my God. Here. Wow. That also could be another episode. Well, um, I mean, well, you know, try, <laughs> yeah, knowing that the people listening are lay people for yeah, the yeah, most yeah. part in terms of, okay. So a lot of people are familiar with post-traumatic stress disorder and mm -hmm. veterans, right? Yes. So flashbacks, nightmares, um, I mean, honestly, like, a, a re one of the really hard parts with post-traumatic stress disorder from being sexually, physically, emotionally, or verbally abused uh, can be confused as other psychiatric diagnoses, like depression, anxiety, intellectual disability, psychosis, which is seeing or hearing things that aren't really there, and having delusions person who's been severely abused will have delusions, but it's not organically a psychiatric disorder. It's a product of 
what they've experienced. So like you think about you get into a horrible car accident, right? Almost Mm -hmm. die, wake up in the emergency room. What just happened? You lost all your memory. That's your brain's way of trying to protect you. So when a victim of sexual abuse changes their story on different interviews or can't remember all of the details, it's more likely that it's a subconscious protection of themselves than them false reporting, which is really interesting. And I can show you some data on this um, that... So I'm going to use, in order to explain this, I have to use, I have to narrow it down a little bit. Um, Victim, child victims of abuse are more likely to recant, which means to take their allegation back and say that it didn't happen. If it started at a younger age, if the person has a parental figure role, or is involved in family, like there's, or a family friend, if when the initial allegation is made, important figures don't believe them and express their disbelief and the victim hears it, they're more likely to take it back. So it happened, but they're going to say it didn't really happen because they just can't tolerate what the system's going to put them through in terms of rehashing the trauma over and over and over again. Um, But of course, a lot of them are depressed and super anxious and have what looks like a flashback. Mm -hmm. And they have these intrusive negative thoughts that can sound like psychosis, like having auditory hallucinations. But really, it's intrusive thoughts, like... The perpetrator has made you believe you're worthless. So maybe you might hear a voice that tells you you're worthless and you need to kill yourself. And parsing those things apart from each other can be really difficult, um, which is another reason why physician psychiatrists are so important because we are relentless in diagnoses and finding the right diagnosis. That's really what separates us from other healthcare providers. Um, how this is, I guess this is kind of a treatment question, but, um, how, uh, how do you help these victims recover and reintegrate after such a severely traumatic experience? Well, one of the protective factors from what I was just talking about, that article, which, like we already said, there's not tons of research. And the way that this was found in the literature, in the medical scientific literature, is because these people were already involved in the justice system. So we are able to get the data. Um, But being removed from that environment where they're being victimized as fast as possible. So the shorter duration of exposure to abuse, um, I don't want to say just protective factor. It's not protective, but well, I mean, I guess it is. Um, You have a higher likelihood of having a positive outcome. If you're, you haven't been abused for years versus one time. Mm -hmm. One time, as you can imagine, is severely traumatic. But imagine these people where it's been going on for five years. A lot of, but there are a lot of people out here who, who don't have memories prior to five years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll tell you what, the brain is fascinating. It does things that we don't understand and we can't control. But to get the treatment question, um, there are a lot of mental health professionals who have opinions on how to treat PTSD in general. Um, A lot of people will tell you that the primary treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, is therapy. You can't medicate this away, y'all. You really can't. 
with saying that, I will say kind of to get at what I was talking about earlier is that, you know, it might look like depression or psychosis, but it's the cause, when you get down to the cause, it's the trauma. But they do have symptoms of depression and anxiety and flashbacks and nightmares. And there are some medications that we can use to help with the symptoms. But at the end of the day, therapy is really the big answer. Okay. Um, what uh, We can take this two ways, I guess. So I'm going to ask both questions. Um, what policies um, contribute to the, to the purpose? the perpetuation of trafficking or what factors um, in a person's life make them more susceptible? I mean, we talked a That's little bit about questions that. questions in one. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> um, I'll start with the first aspect of that. Okay. And the first thing that came to mind was I had a patient once that was over the age of 18, but younger than the age of 20, who was raped by a 16-year-old. And because the victim is over 18 and an adult, that victim could have been charged with statutory rape. Okay. Even though she was the victim, because the perpetrator was young. And you don't normally expect that, right? You picture adults victimizing children, children also victimize children, mm -hmm. but this was a very unique situation and it prevents victims from being able to report. I mean, most of the time people don't believe victims anyway. And you know, it's a really brave action to report something like that because it brings a lot of t attention on you and rehashing trauma over and over and over again also increases the likelihood that someone is going to recant. Mm -hmm. um, because every time you talk about and go through the details of a trauma, from a For Freudian psychoanalytic perspective, you're re-traumatizing. That's why we encourage to only ask about the trauma if you are a trained professional um, so that they, the victim doesn't have to rehash it and remember. And so by keeping remembering and thinking about it, you're solidifying it in their memory and in their brain. Okay. Um, what about uh, the factors that make children more susceptible to being victims of trafficking? Um, so we talked a little bit about substance abuse. I actually found this screening tool literally like two days ago um, that I had never seen before. Um, and it's a screening form tool, um, risk screening for sex trafficking. And the name of it is Metanola. No, wait, is that Metanola? No, I don't even know how to pronounce Meta. Metanoia? I don't know. Uh, M-E-T-A-N-O-I-A. -A. Um, but metanoia? I think that... The, metanoia, maybe? Yeah. Um, like depends on whether it's... but meta... <laughs> maybe, yeah. unless it's French. Yeah. Um, but it, it, I like the screening tool to really, like, highlight some of the risk factors that people would be looking for to identify a victim. Um, and I'll just read some of them off. Um, number, number one is literally that the victim reports it. Okay. Obvious. Mm. Um, if they have ever, if there's an existence of photos or videos of the victimization um, or being used by someone else, to advertise and likely, you know, posting on social media. Um, social media is a whole nother ball game, so uncontrollable. Um, if they've ever engaged in trading something of value, which includes housing, food, water, 
drugs for a sexual act. And honestly, like that's the that's one of the biggest risk factors we should talk about is that a lot of the time, you know, it's not Liam Nielsen and a well-off person who is being kidnapped and trafficked. Mm-hmm. It's people in poverty who are literally just trying to survive. Um, and then you add into that a non or not fully developed brain and you're even at higher risk. Mm-hmm. I imagine that most of the adults in those stats you quoted earlier about what was it? 40% of trafficking victims are American. Yes. And only 25% of those are children. Mm-hmm. My theory to explain those numbers not necessarily like the U.S. born citizen versus not question, um, is that most people aren't actually oh. reporting until they become adults. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, that's it's like 25% of the total, not 25% of the 40%. Oh, it's not? Oh, yeah. okay. Well, I mean, even then, mm-hmm. I mean, it makes sense to me that there are more people who report as adults and therefore are included in this, these measurements Um, Because children, we treat as if they have no decision-making capacity. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I'm very, very passionate about, is that you need to listen to your kids. Like, that's... Or any kid. Like, they are individuals with values. And a lot of people say, oh, no, you're... Do this because I said so. But I think people need to give kids a lot more respect doesn't mean that adults shouldn't have the decision-making power at the end of the day, um, but children are a lot more vulnerable, and we, when we don't believe them when they're seeking help, it is a very big problem. Mm-hmm. Um, but other risk factors, you know, substance abuse, um, Probably some sort of underlying personality disorder contributes to perpetrators becoming perpetrators. But I think that's even a better question is how do they become perpetrators in the first place? Um, And then when when you're looking at risk factors, the biggest risk factor is exposure or experience in your past to it. So say, friend at school... Think Jeffrey Epstein. Mm-hmm. Oh, I met this person. Or I, I knew this person in my life who committed suicide because they had PTSD and they were raped violently. Sorry, y'all. I know that's really uncomfortable, but it happens. Be real. Mm-hmm. Um, or living in a neighborhood or an area that is more susceptible, for example... My home, New Orleans, these kids are extremely susceptible. Poverty. Um, Oh, I forgot to ask you my two questions that I get to ask you. Okay. Number one. You want to do that now? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Number one. Mm -hmm. We're going to separate sex and gender here. What sex do you think makes up the most of that 40% American citizen victim i it i would assume that it's overwhelmingly female yes obvious Mm -hmm. so i I gave you one easy question okay now the difficult one Mm -hmm. um what racial slash ethnic group do you think makes up the biggest portion of those victims of american citizens um I, i would guess the with the Poverty be sent, being such a huge factor, um, it seems, and you know probably also uh, like incomplete homes and like in, in the sense of not uh, uh, two parent households and Mm-mm. and so forth, Mm-mm. not an issue at all. No, that is not okay. I think what I would take the not two parent home and mm-hmm. switch that out for is homelessness. Okay. Which is well, also a yeah. factor that's involved in poverty. Yeah, that's I, I consider that as a subcategory of poverty, um, personally. Yeah. But uh, but my answer would be probably black. 
Um, if not black, probably Hispanic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I asked a question that I don't actually know the answer to, and I'll, that'll get back to the how do we even get the data to support mm-hmm. what do we do? Um, doing research in children is extremely difficult because they're under 18. They don't have their own legal decision-making ca- capacity. Um, we don't empower them to learn how to make difficult decisions. Mm. Um, but I would agree it's pr- the highest prevalence is pr- or the highest number of group or percentage of the group that are victims is between African Americans, black people, and Hispanic people. I kind of wonder if Hispanic Hispanic girls and women might be a, a higher percentage just because of cultural and language barrier issues. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, certainly not being. I, so this is speaking from my experience at uh, a job that I used to have. Um, where people reported um, business abuses, um, which was mostly my boss's mean to be, but sometimes it Mm -hmm. was like uh, something really serious. And what I came across quite a bit was um, Hispanics working at low wage jobs being taken advantage of to a great degree because they didn't understand what their rights were. Mm -hmm. Um, So working off the clock, uh, never getting breaks, things like that, because they just didn't understand what it was that they were, entitled to. Yeah, that makes sense. And it also speaks to the difference between labor trafficking Mm -hmm. and sex trafficking. Um, Because then you really are thinking about adults who, to a lot of people who unfortunately don't have the knowledge yet, are coming to America to take our jobs (laughs) <laughs> and make everything super expensive and make you less marketable and uh, competitive. But honestly, like, ignorance may be bliss, but it also <laughs> makes a lot of these people, like you said, mm-hmm. at risk of being victims. Yeah. Well, and I suspect that, uh, that um, labor trafficking is also mostly adults, but... You know, some of these other factors that we talked about in terms of making people more susceptible to sex trafficking, like substance abuse and so forth, when you're talking about illicit industries to begin with, like selling drugs, um, kids can very easily be used uh, as um, coerced labor for those kinds of activities as well. Mm, Yeah. And I mean, when we talk about labor trafficking, one of the big examples that might come to people's heads is the children working in a Chinese factory. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think the group that we kind of were talking about was more the Latino or Hispanic people being employed, like you described earlier, in these circumstances. Um, And I've been told closer to where I live, it's uh, Eastern European. I believe that. Um, but you again, you have a, a language barrier, mm-hmm. um, a lack a of cultural. understanding of what mm-hmm. you know what labor rights are are here. Knowledge of the law. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're looking at poverty, homelessness, language barriers. Uh, I imagine um, children alone mm-hmm. probably makes them more susceptible. Either parents absent completely or just not around or not interested. Um, Yeah, most people think kids are the most difficult people to control, mm -hmm. but I don't think adults understand how easy they can be to control and that everyone has a responsibility to protect them because they can't protect themselves. Um, Past physical and sexual abuse. Absolutely. Um, I'm curious about, do you have... uh, do you have any idea what the contributing factors to becoming perpetrators? That's a good question. Maybe. It, well, again, you know, this is a question that we can't really get at with data necessarily mm-hmm. because yeah. thinking about how a sex offender becomes a sex offender is a conversation that makes a lot of people really uncomfortable. Um, early on in my career, 
and still now, you know, I think one of the most important things we need to change is actually treating the offender Mm -hmm. so that they don't re-offend. And we see that in like treating pedophilia, but pedophiles aren't as, like in the strict diagnosis of pedophilia, aren't as common as people who abuse others Mm -hmm. in a sexual way. Um, And I can't think of where to find the data on this, but I would be willing to place bets on the commonality between victims and perpetrators being having been been abused themselves, Mm -hmm. um, isolated, uh, groomed from a young age for certain beliefs. Also, grooming uh, victims is also is another oh my god, crazy conversation. Um, but yeah, I think treating we 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 need to pay more attention to the perpetrators and what we're going to do about them, other than putting them in jail and letting them out for some other legal reason, and yeah, I, thinking about treating them so that they don't continue to perpetrate. And build their list of victims. Well, and I'll tell you honestly, when I was reading um, about uh, human trafficking in in preparation for this, uh, you mentioned Liam Neeson earlier. Like I was thinking like what I, when I started looking through charities, I was, I was actually kind of looking for one that, you know, hired people with a specific set of skills Mm -hmm. to go find these kids, release them and make sure that whoever, the perpetrator's word never did anything again. And I'm generally not an advocate of, of violence as a way of solving problems. But hmm. like when I was reading about a lot of these things, like honestly, my thought was the answer to the perpetrators is a bullet in the brain pan. And yeah. And I think, like, I think nobody a lot could of, deserve a lot of it people more. <laughs> feel that way. Yeah. Understandably. Um, but that gets into a deeper ethical yeah, no, I'm, thought I, process of is taking a life ethically justifiable, and it is it your responsibility to do that? Mm-hmm. No, and the answer is obviously no, and I understand yeah. that. Like, I'm a I'm a moral person, and mm-hmm. but uh, it definitely you know brought some really strong emotions to the oh, surface. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. You know. Definitely. Everything we've, we're talking about today mm-hmm. and a lot of discussions we have are uncomfortable topics yeah. that bring about strong emotional reactions. Mm. So it makes sense that the majority of people's first instinct is, well, just kill them. Then, um, you know, we can logic through this all day long, but yeah. it takes I- a lot of effort to be a person who does not react that way. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I would say it really takes a sociopath to be a perpetrator in this case. Like I don't, or, I, I or, can't. or, or a narcissist. They're probably the bigger population. Does, does narcissism not fall under a no. sociopathy? Really? Mm-hmm. Okay. I didn't know that. Um, DSM five. Okay. I, yeah, I don't have it sitting on my table like you do. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I yeah, because my thought was like, I can never quite wrap my head around when I hear these stories. I can never quite wrap my head around somebody, how somebody could treat another person in this way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this People kind do of some really horrible things for money. Yeah. Also, oh, right. who are not sociopaths and narcissists do. Hmm. Slavery seems like a really mm-hmm. big step. Yeah. <laughs> You kind of have to ignore the humanity of the other person entirely. And not respecting other people's autonomy, Mm -hmm. I think, is a really big one. Yeah, and this this encompasses two things that I think are just like the most grievous of sins. Um, Slavery and rape, to me, are far, Mm -hmm. well, maybe not far, but are are the pinnacle of of sins, Um, like worse than murder, because both of these things kind of have the same impact to the people around the victim, mm-hmm. but the victim continues to suffer. Mm-hmm. 
Well, and you know what's even more sad is that, you know, just being victimized itself s- increases your risk of being victimized so much. Mm-hmm. And the term we use for that is re-victimization. Um, you know, the thing that slavery and rape or sex trafficking have in common is exertion of control and taking away an individual human being's power. Mm-hmm. So you can see how someone who has been through that is, first off, terrified of what's going to happen when they report it to lead to action but also is likely to put, not put themselves, please take that back, not put themselves, but somehow happen to be in another situation or react to things in a certain way because perception is reality Mm -hmm. for every individual. Um, So you grow up in poverty or a victim of abuse, that's your normal. Like, being abused becomes their comfort zone subconsciously. Um, And I don't know this to be fact, but I think it's a pretty good theory of why people continue to be victimized. Mm -hmm. Because they're hopeless, they think that they are worthless, and a lot of people convince themselves that they deserve it. Like they, them being, this is what they've they been become a bad person. So therefore, they deserve to be punished because that's what the, what they've been taught. Mm-hmm. Like this is what they've been conditioned to expect from exactly, life. Yeah. So it's all they know. God, it's heartbreaking, y'all. Yeah. Should we like throw something positive in to like bring everybody up real quick? If you want, I was gonna uh, like um, that's that's essentially my list of questions. So yeah. what I had left was, um, is there anything that we haven't talked about here that you want to express to the audience? Ooh, yeah. So if you learn what I hope you learned from today's discussion, another question we need to talk about is once you learn or happen to identify a victim of sexual abuse or trafficking or any of the above, what do you do? Well, you can call 911, but a police officer is not an expert in investigating this type of trauma without re-traumatization. There are a lot of law enforcement out there that are, and Lord have mercy, do I appreciate them so much for prioritizing people with issues with mental health um, rather than shooting them. Um, But if you happen upon someone who you think is being abused, please do not directly ask them to tell you the story or give you all the details. Um, One of the most powerful things you can do when you come upon a victim is to give them resources so that they have access to them, but they don't have to ask for them. Um, You know, the victim's already gone as far if they've endorsed it and reported it, they're asking for help. But just giving people the resources is the biggest thing. Women's shelters, oh my God, the best thing we have in this country that is well-funded. Um, and God, they do such a good job. So it's not just women, but also women and their children getting out of a lot of these situations, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and it, there's a family unit that needs to get away from an abuser. Um, there is also a 1-800 number, and I think I said this to you before, here in New Orleans in the airport in the women's bathroom, we have these little signs on the back of the bathroom stall door that has a 1-800 number that says, if you or someone you know is being trafficked, call this number. And I don't know the name of it. Did you end up looking that up? Um, yeah, I came across it several times, and I'm actually trying to look it up right now real quick. We can just give it to everybody. Yeah, but it's interesting because, um, um, you know, you're in the airport about to get on a plane, sit down to pee, and you're like, oh, 
somebody does know that this is really happening <laughs> and it's not Pizzagate and it's not why we need to build a wall mm -hmm. to keep the Mexicans out. Uh, it is the <clears throat> National Human Trafficking Hotline um, and the number is 888-373-7888. Um, you can also do SMS texts at 233733. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm also curious, and mm -hmm. I would love to know from the males out there, if they're putting these signs in airports in the men's bathroom too. I think that would be a really interesting thing to know. Or if it's just in the women's bathrooms. Yeah, I can't answer that question because I make every effort not to have to sit down in a bathroom <laughs> <laughs> in any airport. Uh, I, there's, there's one other thing I want to bring up too. Um, but uh, they can always email me at Michael at the Liberty Mike and I will forward to you any. Thanks. <laughs> um, is that once someone has reported in order to take legal action, it's incredibly difficult right? Because in the judicial system, there is a heavy burden of proof. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about a victim who may have protective, biological protective actions that cause them to not remember all the details. Mm -hmm. The amount of documentation that you have is also limiting in treating victims. So if you call that number, the information that you want to really get is stuff that can be documented if you're able to get it mm. because that's going to increase the likelihood that something is actually done about it. I imagine another problem that you have is um, unless it's a, an organized crime style like big trafficking ring, Mm -hmm. oftentimes it'll end up he said, she said. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the I was kind of blown away uh, by the frequency of it's a family member, mm -hmm. you know, trafficking a, a <clears throat> young child. And uh, once again, I'm back around to that. Like, I just don't understand how somebody could treat a child that way. But Right. Um this is this is yeah, hurt and I my mean, soul. Uh, this whole the thing. most I think <laughs> one of the like really take home factors is recantation, mm -hmm. right? Because a victim reports and then takes it back because of how horribly we treat victims and how often we don't believe them. That it gives the perpetrator more power to keep doing it because mm -hmm. we're not believing their victims. Oh, God, that enrages me. But, you know, just to demonstrate how intense it is in terms of not believing victims, um, I, most of the research I've seen about children who've been sexually abused as a child who recant, the, the frequency of it it's like 20% of kids who've been sexually abused recant their initial report. That's one in five for those of you that aren't good at math. Yeah. That's mind boggling. Mm -hmm. But it makes sense because the, if you try to put yourself in the victim's shoes, you're alone. You're worthless. No one can help you. You're just trying to survive it's way easier just to give up and say nothing happened because of all the pressure that's being put on you to let it, or not let, but to not cause further pain to the world, not necessarily you, but anybody else who's involved. Mm. I, I would say a, a big thing is like having the, mental ability to put yourself in the experience, in the shoes of a victim and why they might be thinking or feeling something that doesn't make sense to you is extremely important. 
Okay. Do you have anything else that you want to want to add here? Oh man. <laughs> Getting passionate, man. I I got some big strong emotions and I talk about this stuff all the time, so I can only imagine how people who have made it to the end of this are feeling right now. Mm. And I want to reinforce that when you take on the helping role in something this big and horrible, you do have to remind yourself you can't save the world. And like Michael said earlier, what did you say? Saving, saving one, one is person, enough. Saving one is enough. And, you know, I'm not asking you guys out there to go and become experts, um, but learn enough to where maybe you can also save a life. I think that's a really big, inspiring take-home message, don't you? Absolutely. Uh. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Miller, for um, for sitting down for this long and talking about uncomfortable subjects. Yeah, it's my I life. Really appreciate it. Oh, I know that no, makes thank it that much you. more no, th- no, thank amazing you. that you would. <laughs> I'm I'm so appreciative that you just like hap- happened upon this topic and became so passionate about it. I love mm-hmm. that. It's wonderful. Mm-hmm. We need to talk about it in order to progress. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Embrace the discomfort. <laughs> I, you know, life, life is really lived in when you're outside your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. There's, there's some real truth in that. Amen. Um, Oh, like I said earlier, I want to review the, what can the average person do mm -hmm. to help advocate for more governmental funding for the department of child and family services or child protective services? Uh, I don't think you can directly donate, but identifying reputable organizations who are involved with helping these kids or giving social support, housing, that kind of stuff to people who have been victimized is great. One of the ones I mentioned earlier is the court-appointed special advocate. If you Google CASA, Special advocate, it'll probably come up and you can learn more about it. Um, embracing the discomfort, it's my favorite thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and you embrace that discomfort, you learn more, and then you go out and you educate more people so that the, this information could potentially be exponential. You never know. You can have one experience that seems insignificant to you, but actually change a life. Um, And then even better, become a foster parent. And don't only educate others on the most horrible outcome or thing that could happen to a human being, but participate in decreasing further abuse by caring for people who have experienced abuse. Consider becoming a foster parent. Adopt. But if you're going to adopt, don't pay $30,000. Save a kid who needs a safe home. Yeah, it's like going to the shelter to get a new kitten or a new puppy instead of paying the breeders. Yeah, Yeah. men, children, and dogs, man. (laughs) All right. Sorry if I offended anybody. Yeah. <clears throat> I I hope that our audience is not easily offended. <laughs> Good. I don't know how they would listen to us for very long if they were, honestly. So. <laughs> That's true. No. I want to th- say thank you to all those listeners and express mm-hmm. appreciation for just listening to this. I, you know, it's it's hugely one of my passions and I've dedicated my life to other people's children and trying to solve and these huge problems. Um, but I really appreciate those out there who took the time and have tolerated the discomfort of this discussion. And it's always fun to learn new things, right? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a passion of mine. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right. Um, well, we're going to wrap it up then. Thank you again, Dr. Miller. Thank and, you. Uh, um, you can always follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean. Like and share, comment, subscribe, leave reviews. 
You can always email me at michael at thelibertymike.com. Let us know if those signs are up in the bathrooms in airports. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. In the meantime, try to stay free. Ciao. Mm-hmm.